the session is being moderated by uh, Mr. Girish Kulkarni, VCIO and HC, IT Transformation Consultant. Over to you, Mr. Girish. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. So, uh, very elaborate uh, set of introduction for all the panelists. Yes, it's a privilege to have uh, and, and be seated amongst uh, uh, the who's who of uh, the Indian healthcare industry on this uh, podium here. Uh, well, I, I see uh, that it's the last session for the day. There are so many uh, smiling and not so many smiling faces also in this room. The back always is, is heavy as it's usually been there. But then the best part is there's so many of you who have been interested to uh, hear and understand what is uh, Indian healthcare going through and what is there in store for you. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Girish Kulkarni. I work as a, a virtual CIO and a healthcare IT consultant and I work with multiple hospitals across the country. That's a quick introduction about myself. Uh, quickly getting on to the, 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 the discussions here, uh, what I would uh, want uh, to structure this is about a uh, first set of uh, uh, questions which are going to be open to the house, open to the panel and it's going to be a free flow of uh, 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 information. Uh, the second part we are going to spend uh, uh, about five minutes with each of the panelists on, on one of their most important technology deployment which they have done which enhances or improves patient care and outcome of service delivery to the patients. So we spend about another 20 minutes and then we open the house for questions from all of you. Thank you so much. Uh, I would want to start uh, with Arvind A and Arvind uh, alphabetically in English. Arvind, could you uh, tell us what you think were the, the top two uh, technology challenges which you've come across in the last one or two years of uh, you being in the role of uh, the head of uh, IT and CIO for Apollo Hospitals? Well, uh, for healthcare, Delivery to our consumers is absolutely critical. And who is our consumer? The patient is our consumer. The provider is the consumer. And the entire operational network that comprises a health system is a consumer. Ensuring flawless delivery of all services to them is of utmost importance. And this is something that cannot be statistically seen because there's nothing called 99.999 in healthcare. Every life is precious. So I would say our biggest and only technology challenge is ensuring technology works when our consumer is using it. So, so how, how did you mitigate uh, these challenges? Well, keeping it simple, very uh, making sure that no matter what the complexity of technology is for us, we ensure that when it is delivered to the end user, it is simple. Behind the scenes, ensuring that as much redundancy is possible, as much of knowledge about the technology is available, and it is using the right mix of traditional technology and disruptive technology, so that the best outcomes for efficiency and operations are delivered. So that's kind of how we keep it so that when the end consumer is looking at it. And why is the end consumer looking at technology for us today? Because there's a huge need. There's a big supply and demand uh, gap today. So the problem always exists for us. And we're trying to make sure that by as much as possible, hiding the complexity of technology from the end user, and at the same time doing our homework, getting our math right, and delivering that service is how we kind of mitigate it. We wish it is seamless as much as we can. Viren, would you want to take that from NHS uh, perspective? Yeah, so the question is the top two technological challenges that we've uh, encountered. Um, and I'm not an IT guy, so I'll speak more broadly from the perspective of management of a hospital. The two biggest challenges we've had with the technology is, one, it's too expensive, two, it's useless. It's useless because it doesn't do what we want it to do. We've invested in SAP, in Oracle, in uh, expensive hospital information software from the Middle East. We just put in Salesforce, 
and we're looking at a bunch of other enterprise level software. And it's useless because we've had to adapt every single part of operations and the way we function to fit to the software. And still no one's satisfied. Uh, the doctors aren't satisfied with the results they get. The finance isn't satisfied with the numbers that come out. There are integration issues. It fails on a nearly constant basis. If uh, a hospital ran with the same kind of accuracy that the software does, we'd, we'd not call ourselves a hospital, we'd call ourselves a slaughterhouse. So the challenge for us going forward, which the you know, next question will be how do I mitigate this, is we have to start completely rethinking the role of enterprise software in large hospitals and look at doing it ourselves. Because simply the large uh, software companies from the Europe and the US aren't taking care of our needs. Right? They've taken some software that worked in enterprise in large uh, manufacturing companies 20 years ago and said, okay, somehow make this fit into your hospital environments. Well, uh, point taken. So, which means within what you're saying is we go back uh, from uh, our Alan Solis and Van Usens and Louis Philippe back to our regular tailors who would come and then take your measurement and then stitch it because there's no one thing which fits everybody here. Something like that? Not really. It's it's not a question of tailor making. So all these softwares have an ability to customize, but they're not answering the central question, right? When I look at a soft like uh, EMR, for example, and that's something we'll talk about a lot later. EMR solutions are hugely expensive, and they occupy um, massive servers. Or if you put it on a the cloud, then it's a huge uh, expenditure for you month on month. And at the end of the day, it just does a functionality of five percent better than paper. The only advantage you get out of digitizing your EMR is that you don't have that much space and you don't pay rent on warehouses, right? There's not a lot of intelligence built in. The most intelligent thing they managed to build into EMR today is a software that allows you to check if medicine uh, errors can come in when uh, drugs interact with one another, right? The, the truth is, the way software is being used in hospitals now, we just use it as a glorified typewriter, right? Analytics is not built in. Software is not helping doctors make better decisions. The software is not used to help the clinician make better uh, input decisions, not giving the patients the freedom to uh, get better data. So that is the, uh, so it's not a question of one size fit all, it's that we're looking at it the wrong way. Okay. Well, <coughs> that, that's a very interesting thing which you brought in here. Applications built uh, in the Western world uh, and not get customized to what the Indian practices are. So what I would do is instead of going to Nankishore, now I, I actually go to Som. Because Soam comes in with a lot of experience of having worked in the Western world, built applications, handled clients there. So, how how do you want to handle this? From what we yeah. were saying. Yeah, Vinay and uh, Arvind, I think uh, you have brought in some good points. Uh, uh, particularly, uh, the challenge we as a we are a provider of technology. Thankfully, we are not uh, software uh, companies. Otherwise, Vinay would not have allowed me to sit here. Uh, but having said that, uh, we are a provider of technology and you are the, uh, the uh, consumers of technology. Uh, so what we find is that two things in the, in any industry, I call it as a Goldilocks syndrome, where people don't know, the, the users don't know what has to be customized, what has to be configured, and the, and the IT service providers uh, go by the user recommendation and it always falls short and they fall short of the user's needs or expectations and there lies the challenge of how far should I go uh, to make the customer happy and in the process the software gets uh, overly customized, maintenance cost increases, these things don't, it is a lose-lose situation for everyone. So you are right that most of the software which are being used today, uh, the enterprise software are mostly from the western world their ability to customize to the Indian needs, both from the cost side as well as from the, uh, from the way the Indian healthcare industry works, I think they have not spent enough time to do that. The second uh, challenge which I f we face as IT service providers is the, the, the level of heterogeneous computing which has gone on uh, now. We had mainframes, we have now personal computers, we, had, we have now mobile devices, so with all these things coming in and then there are versions, there are operating systems, there are form factors, meeting all these things is a challenge for us. Uh, I will give a recent example where we implemented a, a mobility solution for a, uh, for a uh, not for a healthcare company, for a manufacturing company. The day we launched it, the, the same day Apple announced their, uh, their 8.0 uh, 
operating system and the customer said that I want to do this. So once I, once I do this, there are other cascading problems which come up. So, so this is the second problem which we face, which uh, users need to appreciate. The third problem in particular in healthcare is privacy, compliance and IT services. They all look to be oxymoron to each other because when, when I have to protect the privacy of the uh, user, how do I outsource the job to be done? So there lies the challenge of trying to do many things from the data side so that I don't compromise for my customers. So these are the three challenges we face when we deal with customers. So we, we've heard uh, Apollo and then uh, NH. Uh, I think we need to hear from uh, Manipal also what they think are, are those two biggest challenges they have been having. Well, good evening. Uh, so I just, uh, this month I completed six years in Manipal. So I can definitely give a couple of good uh, you know, perspective. Uh, well, the non-clinical aspect uh, of, uh, of, of uh, technology is pretty well managed, adopted, accepted uh, in Manipal, quite matured on those lines. However, uh, the biggest challenge for us so far was uh, the clinical adoption, how we convince doctors or how we make doctors use technology and not really give, say, uh, you know, handwritten prescription to the patient. Uh, we had been trying different strategies. Uh, uh, you know that uh, uh, e-pain and uh, some kind of different technologies, audio and all that thing uh, didn't work. Uh, after the you know uh, the mobility, which is typically the iPad or the Android devices, we were able to somehow convince a particular group of doctors that yes, this can be a substitute to paper. But there are again challenges. Not every doctor. Uh, wants to use uh, the, the technology, whether it's iPad or whatever, and they still want to use paper. So what we did, this definitely is a challenge, and uh, therefore we said that, okay, we are not going to set the expectations quite high. Let us just focus on, say, 25% adoption year one. And we formed a group of uh, tech savvy doctors who are kind of young, and they kind of, you know, uh, want to use technology in their day-to-day -day life. Uh, so that worked well, and uh, as as we well, as I speak and we discuss this point, uh, we are in the process of uh, deploying those technologies. We signed off with a company called Praxify, which is a Pune-based company, and a software which is developed by them is fully uh, touch-based software where a doctor can actually use completely a touch interface and not really type anything, and he can prepare a prescription, he can see the X-ray reports there. We can see the past patient records there. So this is how we are trying to mitigate this particular challenge. The, the second challenge uh, which we had was more of the analytics part of it, the dashboards part. We had various reports, some 200, 300 reports. Every unit has their own reports. So somehow we standardized the reports part and defined around some say 71 or 80 kind of reports and around say 20 dashboards at each level. Now the next point, the next challenge there was that how reliable is the data, which is coming to these uh, this dashboards. So uh, the, the, the mitigation strategy for that was that removing the manual interventions wherever we feel that somebody is manually entering the data. So how do we capture the data directly through system and therefore we make the dashboard reliable. Just to take an example, uh, GK, uh, is that uh, we have something called as monthly business review meetings where we discuss the unit performances. So we have typically some 15 templates there where we discuss complete performance of each unit, each hospital, whether it's a revenue, it's a, a loss, or it is a, you know a number of consultations, number of surgery done, uh, all those parameters. So the effort, the efforts are how do we make that data come from system? Because we have pretty stable, well managed back end operations which are run on the HIS and run on the SAP. Uh, so, just to summarize my point, the challenge was only and only the clinical adoption, which we are dealing with, uh, what I explained that, forming a group, small group, and keeping the expectations to around 25% in year one. Well, my, my next question to the panel is, is a little uh, longer question, but then what we spoke about for the last few minutes was, what is it that they faced in the last two years? What do you think is, from a technology perspective, the next big thing which the healthcare providers are going to adapt over the next two or three years. 
if it's open to the panel, we could you could pick up from. Uh, well, if all of us are sitting here and we don't use the words mobility, cloud, IoT, I think we're not doing justice to sitting here. So let's just keep those words there. We had enough of that. <laughs> so you know, we also said it. Okay. Uh, I think the ability for technology to be much more interactive is what is going to be the game changer for adoption because we got technology to the points that were made earlier is it being used is it effective is it delivering results so technology that is going to be interactive and technology that is going to have the ability to understand the complexity of healthcare the algorithms of healthcare that can deliver healthcare results i think that is what is going to be the game changer so it's is it a combination of iot big data yes is it a combination of mobility and uh, you know, smart screens yes but it's that technology that is going to help adoption and whatever the technology is it need not be something from mars but it could be something very simple I think that will be the game changer for us. So I would like to add to what Arvind said. Uh, mobility is definitely going to play a big role. And uh, uh, 4G started going out. So we can see more and more M health related initiatives where the wearables have started coming in. But because of the cost, you know, they are still at a POC or demo kind of level. So wearables are going to play a big role, which can be your post surgical care chronic uh, kind of uh, care so where wearables definitely will be you know big thing also telemedicine eicu you know those technologies are going to play a big role so that is how i think uh, next two years we can see healthcare moving to yeah from an it services provider we have seen that uh, uh, the convergence of platform as uh, arvind mentioned uh, i would say convergence of uh, social and mobile uh, are delivered on a cloud platform, ultimately coming out with something which is personalized for, our, for the patients would be the disruptive technology. So it is a, it will evolve, not that uh, people may talk about evidence-based based medicines, personalized uh, care and things like that, but all these data points have to be properly, uh, uh, should co converge through, through the data which comes out from the mobile devices or from the social media platforms and delivered uh, in a possibly uh, cost-effective manner on the on, on the cloud would be the way to go. So just to add one more point, GK, uh, if you can permit me, yes, uh, there is a lot of pressure on the uh, sweating the assets what hospital uses, and uh, definitely management they want to understand as to what is the asset utilization, and uh, you know what is the spend on the assets maintenance and management. So RFID is also going to be you know there, and the cost has really come down. So. Like again, we are evaluating some solutions on the RFID, where you want to understand, uh, you know, in terms of the utilization and the spend on maintenance of the assets, patient tracking, patient monitoring, flow monitoring, flow management, blood bags, uh, tracking, and all those things. So RFID is going to also play a big role in the healthcare industry in India. I'll make one very quick point on the disruptive technologies. Yes, mobile will definitely be one of them. But the biggest story around that is what this mobile phone can do. You see, some of the most innovative uh, softwares and apps coming out of the U.S. are in the consumer healthcare space. Uh, things of fitness tracking, you know, Fitbits and things that maintain your health and lifestyle and all of that. Why, if you ask yourself, why is it that these apps are designed for outside the hospital rather than inside the hospital? It's simply because hospitals have built up these huge walls around the IT infrastructure, staffed with hundreds of people working in IT that have to work in this closed loop environment. Right? So the way we see it is disruptive applications working within the hospital. I'll give you a simple case. Uh, let's say you go and visit your cardiologist and if you have a heart problem and you quickly say, okay, you need to go visit the diabetologist. He'll either scribble something on a piece of paper or he'll enter some data into, his, uh, uh, into your electronic medical record. Then you take your file, you go to the diabetologist and by that time he'll have to go open up your
from one doctor to the other. We got a team of six developers from Bangalore. We launched this app on the App Store. It's called Bol, B-O-L. You can download it, any, uh, any of you, and just try it out and see if it works for you, right? In two months, in less than 10 lakh rupees, we built a software that all of our doctors are using to just to quickly transmit data from one end of the hospital to the other, right? There are hundreds, if not thousands, of applications, micro-applications around the hospital that can be enabled if doctors and administrators within the hospital work closely with app developers in Bangalore, in the U.S., or wherever they are, to fulfill these micro needs. Because if we look at this as one giant problem, we're making the same mistakes that everyone made when they decided to build enterprise level software to take care of all our needs. Yeah, amazing point. Yeah, that's very valid, uh, extremely valid there. We've spoken about a lot of technology coming in. I couldn't resist myself, but I need to ask how much of IoT or Internet of Everything is going to be a game changer for you all? Well, uh, honestly speaking, uh, I'm not a big fan of Internet of uh, Things because I feel that uh, though it uh, gives a feel that we are in control, but someone is taking uh, that control from us. And if I'm uh, regularly prompted that this is what I have to do and there is a interlocutor between myself and the ecosystem which I work in, then I feel very stifled. So I'm not a big fan, but given that I'm in IT, I should talk about something about variables and uh, I, uh, Internet of Things. Uh, so uh, there are certain things which uh, IoT can do, um, and uh, the, I, I don't know how far it will impact, but there are certain areas where it can impact where, if at all, uh, sensor-driven data can be processed and can, uh, can if we can find out through internet, in the internet of things that who, uh, what disease will afflict uh, a, a person rather than which person has what disease. If that transition happens, then I think internet of thing, uh, thing is the way to go. If that does not happen, it will be another, uh, I would not say fad, I would say that it will be another a way of technology evolving and it will uh, not catch on and not, not be mainstream. Why I'm saying so, if you see the so-called Internet of Things, the last, we have, we have seen Fitbits and others for the last uh, maybe three and a half, four years. The total revenue generated out of these things is just 330 million. And if you would see it in, uh, in the light of Apple's turnover of 171 billion, it is nothing, but maybe it is a slumbering giant which will wake up someday, I don't know. But uh, at this moment, uh, it, it is a long way to go. Yeah, look at it as Gartner still has put it in the hype quadrant, so... Definitely. See, look at it as an empowered community. See, healthcare should be dealt with as knowledge that transcends across everybody, not as fear that grips anybody. So, the community needs to know more about it and that's a great way to look at preventive health that's a better way to stay healthy it's a better way to know what you're going through the doctors are able to explain it in a better way such that they are able to align with the patient and overall the system has knowledge of what's going on multiple sides the multiple sides of the story so Internet of Everything is possibly an empowered community, an empowered clinical community, an empowered patient or consumer community. More than the patient, the caregivers. So, at home, we are the caregivers for our parents. We are the caregivers for the children. Our children take care of us. So, the caregivers, so that empowered community who knows about health, I think that will be the benefit of Internet of Things. I'll go further than anyone on this panel and just say the Internet of Things will change the way hospitals look today. Uh, a simple example, there's a new technology for the analyzing blood samples called iStack. It's based on these lab on a chip concepts. There's a company called uh, Theranos in the US that can do a whole number of tests based on a single drop of blood, right? If you're able to commercialize that, then you can sell it to consumers. So if I'm a company whose only job is running pathology and diagnostic labs across the country, I'd be very scared of this technology. 
because chips, you know, you've seen uh, Moore's law and the cost of chips and what happens with time. So if every phone gets enabled with a simple chip, you won't have the need for pathology labs anymore. Another thing is a classmate of mine from Stanford, she showed me uh, a single lead ECG that clips onto the back of your phone. So our cardiologists have really tough time with monitoring chronic heart patients because they need to keep coming in, get the ECG rigged up, then get the readings and get an interpretation. When you rig this up, all you need to do is connect that to the back of your phone, uh, when through the 3G, hold it onto your heart, the reading comes, it gets sent to the cardiologist and he sees it real time. So that eliminates multiple trips to the doctor going forward. Uh, so what does that mean for the cardiologist? The number of post uh, treatment visits he gets starts to come down, it impacts his bottom line. Uh, this has implications for, you know, diabetology as well because chronic diabetes patients are ones that are constant medication. If their follow-ups can be done at home, uh, that changes the economics for a lot of clinics going forward. So Internet of Things, yes, it empowers uh, consumers, it creates a community of people and gives you more information about your uh, health uh, information, but it's going to have a tremendous impact on the way hospitals interact with you. And we no longer become this one-stop shop where you come in and everything happens at an NH Fortis Apollo, none of that. You know, you will have the choice to decide uh, what is closest to me, what's most convenient for me, and I'll only go there maybe once or twice in my life, and everything else can happen at home. Okay, so uh, from my perspective, uh, IoT or IOE, let's say everything, Right, so this is basically going to change the complete, uh, you know, uh, picture the way we provide the healthcare. Today, the major concern for every healthcare organization is the real estate cost, and we all know, like, managing, maintaining the facility is, is very costly, and therefore, opening new hospital is a big investment. Uh, just to add on uh, to what Arvind said, uh, is that you empower the patient so that patient is able to take the services from wherever he is. He doesn't have to physically come to the hospital to take the consultation or collect his report or do a you know, sample test or whatever. Or also get uh, maybe post-op care. So when uh, IoT comes uh, you know, and there is a big, big adoption, it will help people to connect with the care facility uh, from wherever they are. And uh, we, we, we never know there can be another flip card where there's nothing as a physical thing. It's, everything is online. It's virtual kind of uh, you know environment so iot is actually going to help in a big way and which will bring down definitely the cost of managing the facilities and will move away more and more from the brick and mortar kind of model for the hospital that is what i feel so, so that that's probably the assessment that the the wall which you spoke within which the hospitals have built themselves that's going to be broken so we see another burning wall coming down yeah <laughs> okay uh, we move from technology now a little different, more towards a process and uh, transformation there. With the adaption of these technologies, how much of process changes have actually happened in your system and has it happened for better or not? Viren, uh, Arvin? From a process change point, point, definitely it's gone on the right track. Uh, we go after international type certifications like Joint Commission International or NABH or NABL. All of this is with the intent of ensuring that it is streamlined, structured, error free and you maintain the pristine patient quality and safety. So process orientation is for that. Yes, at times it does go bad in terms of uh, making it too rigorous or trying to adapt to something that is naturally not. And that's kind of what needs to be avoided and that's the pitfall of implementing technology. But at the same time, I would say done right, taken right with the right spirit of adoption, process orientation is maturing, standardization. Again, the word standardization is exceptionally controversial. You got to be very careful when you say standardization in healthcare, because if no two bodies are standard, then we'd have cloned people long time ago. So you got to look at it in terms of patient quality, patient uh, thing effectiveness, efficiency, and not missing those critical quality parameters. And that's where process is coming into play, and that's where things are being streamlined. I'll probably not use the word standardized. Uh, I, I would like to add on to this. Uh, 
Uh, now, whenever IT goes and they implement various solutions, let's let's take a simple example of HIS and go and do a you know deployment of the HIS registration, admission, discharge, billing, OT, and all that stuff. Uh, typically, what we have experienced is that every so, for example, we are the enterprise and we got say 15 hospitals across India. Uh, every unit may not have a standard process, right? And when it comes to a deployment, and then IT asks, okay, tell me what is that I should do. There are four or five different processes followed by these different units. So I still see a lot of things need to be done there because there needs to there need to be a, a kind of you know owner for this entire process standardization. It is definitely not the IT because the process is defined by the business. IT has to implement the process. The challenge is IT does not get to know what is the standard process. So today, if you if I take example of again Manipal Hospital. Uh, we, we are having on board somebody called as a chief process officer. So if there is an issue in some billing process and some unit, they say, no, I want this way. So this guy is going to say, no, this is what the process is. So because that job IT cannot do. So this particular position today in the healthcare industry is becoming very important. The person who defines, controls, standardizes the processes across the hospitals. And then that person may have a committee, you know, uh, there can be a representation from clinical, non-clinical operations and all that stuff, marketing and finance. But there has to be a, a, a person and in charge who controls the processes so that IT job becomes easier to implement and therefore the adoption will be much easier. Right. Yeah, I would like to take the, uh, the situation of the payer, the provider and what type of changes will happen in the Indian industry. Uh, if you see, typically uh, in, in, in India, uh, patients possibly are not insured. I was seeing the last statistics to be 70% of the patients are not insured. They pay on their own. They don't go through an insurance uh, company or agency. Uh, in the Western world, it is a totally a different world. 90% 90, 90 of the patients are insured. So I see the, if any process change will happen, it will be happening in the revenue cycle management between payer and provider in the Indian context, which is already a, a, a fairly big activity in the Western world. So that will uh, mean a lot of things, a lot of changes to be done in the uh, provider from the provider side as well as from the payer side. Well, so I am going to follow it with a very direct question to you. Yeah. Uh, Technology adaption again is, is dependent on a lot of uh, process, standards, regulatory uh, stuff. You know? How much of regulation is important for technology adaption? And how do you see it being different between the West and what's happening in India? As I, uh, yeah, I think I preempted this question maybe. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, so let us just uh, analyze the difference between the Western world and the world which we are in in India. Uh, just see the insurance percentage in the Western world and the insurance percentage in, in, the, in India. Uh, just see the doctor's percentage in, in India is 0 0.7 to 1000 patients, while in, the, while in the world, the world average is 2.8, so it is, it is one fourth the number which is in the, in the, uh, in the Western world or in, across the world. Number three is, uh, if you see, uh, in India, I am told that 50% of the patients have to travel 100 kilometers uh, to meet their doctors uh, or meet the doctor. So all these things make it very uh, different. The India world is, the world in India where we live in, where we are attended by doctors, is a very different world than the Western world. And uh, I will again pick up the point from Vinay where the Western software, enterprise software are shoved down the throat saying that, hey, this will work with some minor customization. It will not work because the things are very different. So the technology adaptation has to be uh, at a process level. I am seeing that a lot of companies are coming out with hospital information system which are India-centric. There are a couple of companies like Manorama Software is fairly strong in the hospital in, uh, system, enterprise software where they do the process mapping and then they come out with the, uh, with the right kind of uh, software or application. In terms of regulation, um, 
I have come across the importance of uh, ICD uh, coding in the Western world. Uh, today, in the, as we are preparing for this panel, I was asking uh, Arvind and uh, Nand uh, to figure out uh, whether the same level of intensity and rigor is there in the India in the Indian context. Uh, I was told yes, but the thing is that if reimbursement of the doctors does not happen through ICD code, then the patient care and the other things which we which we would expect would not be that 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 uh, well managed uh, if if this activity is not there. So quality measures have to be done through this coding activity, and this coding activity will result in proper patient care and. Uh, productivity of hospitals. So the so the point is the regulation has to look at these two elements. Excellent. And that that gives me my next question straight to Arvind. Arvind's been on the panel with the Ministry of Health, where he works very closely on uh, the regulatory uh, part of uh, the healthcare IT and technology adaptation. So Arvind, how do you think you know the, the national electronic health record standards are getting evolved and what is it that the state, from a regulatory perspective, doing to, you know, force this or bring this kind of an adaptation here? Um, see, first and foremost, it's definitely delightful to know that we have an official national electronic medical record standards that has been released by the Ministry of Health and is available right on the ministry's website. And we fully acknowledge that health is a state subject in India and cannot be pushed from the federal government. So the government is doing everything it can to work with state governments, to work with private sector, to work with not-for-profit organizations, NGOs, technology solution providers such that the solutions that are being built are built around standards. They are built around standards such that that precious interoperability may happen. Because a patient is not probably going to go to just one institution for servicing his healthcare needs. So how do you ensure that that health information is interoperable and health is health is health. Color of blood to the best of my knowledge, I am not a doctor, I think is red. So it cannot be that health information between two institutions are in different parameters and hence the government has released a metadata standard. So as is common, did Ministry of Health do something that is cooked up by them? No. They followed what is done by the National Informatics Center. So the entire vocabulary is standardized and it is the same thing that is being used in the ration card or in the voter ID card or in the passport that is being adopted for healthcare. So there is a common metadata definition which is a standard. So if a patient has to be described as a male and there is a acronym or a thing, a, a, a particular character to be uh, thing denoted, it is standardized. It is not that somebody can use 1, somebody can use M, somebody can use ML and that's then you get into, in the way of looking at a CIO, services from a software company that inc uh, increases cost. So that is where you have metadata standards. Is trying to get this into regulation. It is still a standard today. It is not regulation. There is no penalty if somebody doesn't follow it. So typical, I won't follow it. So the next step is regulation. And involving all the stakeholders, the technology solutions companies, the implementers, the educators, catch them young, put, put it in colleges, put it in med school, put it in nursing colleges, so that everybody is acquainted about it. Then you have a national electronic health record that is usable, adoptable and understandable. Understanding is very important because if we don't understand, we are not going to use it. And using these standards, it's interoperable. Thereby now, the larger picture of 
national population health management can be achieved? Can we look at samples across India? Can we look at what sample of India is prone to heart diseases? What sample of India is prone to cancer? Can we get that real statistic on which we can work, not for a white paper presentation? That comes out of standards. That means that each one of our institutions, government or private, ASHA worker or a public health organization, NGO or an AIDS awareness center, all of them use the same thing because everybody is dealing with the subject of health. So that's where the government is doing this. These are standards that are available on the Ministry of Health and they come up for reviews and public is allowed to comment on that. These comments are taken, ratified, put into expert panels and the best thing, it's all time bound. It's not an infinite project and it doesn't go on for many years. So that means there's hope coming for us. So LK, how, how do you think it's how easy or how difficult it is to uh, adapt to these guidelines as a, as a uh, provider? Well, uh, as a provider, certainly the, uh, the vendors who are providing uh, these HIS solutions, the software solutions to the hospitals, uh, once the standards, uh, they are kind of uh, implemented and mandatory to, to the hospitals to, to adopt them, uh, it makes vendors' job easy. Because as I said, that uh, you know, vendors are not able to do the deployment because every hospital uh, have different processes. They are not able to standardize their software. When there, is a, there are guidelines that this is what we are supposed to do and this is what every hospital has to follow. So that indirectly helps the vendors and that further helps them to bring down the cost because the similar solution is now available or accepted by the entire industry as such. So I think it, it is going to help in a big way. I think what we are going to do now is stop debating, asking questions. We look at what each one of the, the, the gentlemen here and, and their organization have done from a, a technology adaption perspective. So can we switch on to the first slide here please? Uh, what we did here was, this is called Apollo Prism, which is the patient engagement platform. This is something that is integrated to the hospital's health information system and it communicates to the patient. So what does it communicate? This is not a results disbursement system. We call this the patient's health diary. So the ability by which we can stay in constant touch with the patient pushing him the health information that he needs, understanding his health needs and catering to it. So based on the diagnosis, we intelligently try to give him educational material so that he can be more knowledgeable on the nature of health that he needs. The nature of health that his logical family will need. And the ability to manage effectively chronic diseases. Diabetes. Well-managed diabetes can be much more effective than costlier treatments. So how do you ensure that the hospital, the patient, wearable technology integrated into the patient health record is available to a medical response center that can look at it, analyze the patient situation, congratulate the patient if he is well-managed or get intervention given to the patient, transfer the patient to the right specialist or the tertiary care as appropriate. That is what you are looking at as an effective patient engagement solution. On the cloud, it is with the patient wherever they travel, they don't need to take those bags of paper with thousands of documents from n number of institutions. And if they go across institutions, they can scan it and upload it. So it is your online health diary that travels with you and you can use it as your jogger, as your jotter, so that when you go next to the doctor, ensure that you are asking the right questions, so you are also getting the right answers for your health care. So that's what we did with uh, Apollo Prism. We are uh, fortunate to have close to 2.5 million uh, patients on it with an active usage of close to 33 percent. Go to the next one. 
Yeah, uh, this is what uh, uh, in Manipal, uh, uh, you know, uh, we have done uh, certain implementations and uh, for us, uh, if it is, you know, any initiative of technology, if it is not touching these areas, then that is no more an initiative and it doesn't get any uh, investment or buy-in at, at the management level. So let me go to the next level, uh, next slide. This is the real actual picture from the doctors who have started using uh, the 100% touch-based solution using uh, the iPads. This is in progress. Uh, some doctors started using it and as I said, we are not keeping our expectations to 100%. We want to go slow. We want to see adoption. We want to see it helps. Uh, the benefits, the quick benefits is that today, uh, these patients can get the printed prescription, which is a big thing because read doctor's prescription, uh, you, we all of us know, right? And interpretation uh, can be different, there can be errors. This solution also integrates with your drug database, so it can check the doses, drug to drug reactions and all that stuff. Doctors can see the x-rays and all that stuff on the iPad directly. They can see the past patient records. Uh, this will throw the prescription uh, to the patient portal and uh, there is also an app component on the mobile. So the prescription will come to the app where you can set the medicine reminders and all that stuff. So this is one deployment which is in full swing as of now at Manipal hospitals. The OPD part is what uh, I have taken the pictures. The IPD is in patient when doctor goes on round, the bedside uh, patient information he can access on the, on the iPad directly and vitals and all that stuff. Next slide. Uh, this is another deployment which I said that around 18, 19 dashboards have been deployed. The strategy is first do mobility, then go to desktop. Because we know the entire, mostly the management, they are all always mobile, they are traveling. And uh, wherever they are, they need to understand uh, various dashboards, the revenue, uh, the, uh, you know, the asset utilization part of it, the discharges, the admissions, the loss and stuff like that. Third, there is a third one. This is uh, something called as, you know, measuring the patient feedback. Again, using uh, technology like iPad online. So, uh, something which you, you can't measure, you can't improve. So, this particular platform is helping us. On an average, every day we are capturing around 1,500 to 2,000 feedback across all these hospitals <coughs> using iPad. There is a portal, straightway management can log in and see where do we stand in terms of various services, waiting time for doctor, your quality of food, your parking things, facility, security. Uh, waiting time at pharmacy, etc. I can see on the real-time basis. These are three things which we are, this is already implemented, dashboard already implemented, and uh, doctors using uh, the, the iPad kind of stuff, it is in the progress, around some 15% or 12% is already done on ground. That, that's one. it from my side. Okay, uh, this is also uh, the patient feedback where you can see the screenshots and all that. That's it. The next presentation. Next. Just to add on, this is uh, in multiple languages. We have taken some around 18 languages which patient can select from that and give the feedback on the iPad. Fully touch-based, nothing, no typing. Uh, let me give you some background uh, on this. Uh, I th uh, we had prepared a pipe slider, unfortunately we could not load it on that machine. If anyone would like to see this, we have got an iPad, we can show it on the iPad. Uh, let me give a context uh, to this. Uh, this opportunity which we had uh, worked on, it is called the differential diagnosis engine which we have developed for a Western uh, customer. It is a, uh, is a cardiologist who wanted this to be uh, done. It, the code was already available with him, but we, we uh, were, as an IT services company, were told to improve the accuracy of differential diagnosis from uh, his existing level of 67% to around 90% by using the right algorithm and the analytics tool to do that. So the idea is not ours, uh, the idea came from one of our uh, customers. But when uh, this opportunity came to speak about disruptive technology, I felt that uh, whatever has been developed uh, there could be uh, very well adapted to the Indian conditions. Uh, let me give you the reasons why it can be adapted. Uh, Differential diagnosis is a systematic way of diagnosing the multiple factors which, uh, uh, which need to be identified before we come to a conclusion what is the patient's uh, ailment. 
so the algorithm helps in doing that. It shrinks the possibilities of the candidate uh, uh, conditions and com comes to a uh, fairly telescopic way of suggesting that this could be the uh, proper, uh, this could be the, this is the diagnosis and this could be the possible ailment. Uh, why we wanted to dumb down the process is in India, as I had mentioned, the doctor, doctors are pretty sparse and they are more sparse in, uh, in the rural part of the uh, part of India where the percentages are just negligible. So we, f we believe that this kind of tool, if at all it is deployed, uh, the paramedical uh, guys could, uh, like the nurses or the compounders in clinics could do this assessment smartly using this intelligent device and then pass on the right cases based on the urgency and the need to the, to the doctors uh, and the doctors could uh, treat them. So we did this exercise for six months. Uh, we used uh, an algorithm which is uh, the association rule. Uh, if uh, anyone would have heard of the concept of market basket analysis, that is an association rule which is used. We use the similar association rule here to figure out uh, the combination of the chief complaint of the, of the patient and the uh, actual ailment which he, should, he or she should be having. So the, uh, I'm, I, will, I can show you the NLP programming, natural language processing which was done of the, uh, of the patient's uh, um, verbatim um, way of saying what the ailment is and then how it is processed, codified and then presented as a summary document and we uh, increased the level of accuracy from 67% uh, to 90%. So that was a big achievement for us, uh, which uh, got us the uh, award in a healthcare uh, summit, which we participated uh, some time ago. So the point I'm making is uh, this differential diagnosis as a, as a way to go, uh, is the way to go given the uh, way we are in, uh, in terms of do doctor penetration in various, uh, various parts of the country. And this will be an excellent and intelligent aid to help us. Just take it and go and keep it there and put white there. So the family will stick to that also. I'll just give a little bit of background behind this. Uh, your mobile device, your cell phone, your tablet is more or less your primary computing device. You, know, you may go on your laptop to check email, but at the end of the day, it's your uh, tablet or your phone that's with you all the time. So ask yourself what led to the phenomenal success of your tablet or your mobile phone as a computing device? And that's because of apps. Right? Apps simply because you have the option of whatever your manufacturer decided to give you, or if you don't like it, you can swap it out with something that uh, someone can give you for free, or a paid application from a hundred different uh, developers. So our idea for developing software for a hospital is to look at very specific problems faced by doctors in very limited situations, and then apps around that. Right? And if someone can do it better, we'll swap that out and go for it. So we want to create an app store for a hospital and your combined app store will eventually be called a hospital information system. So rather than build this giant uh, software that takes care of all things, our idea is to go for very small individual apps that can take care of small parts of your uh, the day to day work of dealing with the hospital. So I told you about the voice messaging system we worked on earlier. Another software we worked on was <coughs> with a very simple uh, radiology reporting system. So they made us a tablet-based software that you can use while uh, doing the uh, while the ultrasound technicians are doing the scan. With one hand, and the other hand, they can just with a tablet quickly add the data without having to type on a keyboard. There is a very limited application, and they've done an excellent job. Of it. This is what I'm talking about. is a clinical decision support software. This is slightly more ambitious. The idea behind that is to build in intelligence into all your reporting data. For the now, when a patient is in the ICU, they have the charts, right? You record your oxygen saturation, you record your temperature pressure, you record your heart rate, uh, you record the drugs that go in, and it's all done on paper. Paper is not intelligent. So the next level of that is to put it on a computer, then it just becomes a system of taking in data. 
so that when something goes wrong, once he's dead or once the patient goes to a severe complication, you go back and figure out what went wrong. Our idea is to build intelligence into the software we real time. Are so, clinical decision support software is built on the app. Right? Uh, there's a screenshot of for India reasons I'm not allowed to show it at all. So, okay, the tablet has the data that you can put on a daily basis, put in fields from all the machines attached to the patients, but you can do it yourself. If the software detects an anomaly, a range that is beyond the parameter, it will then start to alert the first then response. Right? It says, okay, oxygen saturation is too low. And then it starts suggesting a list of things that you need to do. And you can't stop the software, you can't ignore that. Unless you do the corrective action, it will uh, keep stopping you and send an alert to you next physician, the next senior intelligence to come and look at the patient. So what this does is, it forces doctors to go through the standard clinical protocol. And that is one of the biggest problems facing medicine today. That every doctor has developed his own style of operating, their own ways and you know, while the clinical protocol was established a hundred years back and written in the textbooks, most doctors have forgotten some of it or they decided to take shortcuts around it and most of the time that's fine. It's only when something goes wrong that you wish that okay, everyone worked in a standardized uh, way. So doctors historically are very, uh, absolutely repulsed by using you know, the keyboards and the typing. So we have to make sure that this software can work on the tablet. It's very simple to use. It's drag and drop. It's you know, swiping of the finger. Minimal amount of typing. So we're developing this software for a US-based hospital. And uh, they did it because they believe this would replace the EMR eventually. And uh, this is software that we developed, co-developed with them, with our team sitting over here, with a large software company, and uh, them. So when this happened, this will be the first instance of a joint uh, product being developed between an Indian hospital and an American hospital, made primarily for US patients. But it's something that all hospitals around the world benefit from greatly because our prediction is this will be a fraction of the cost of the current uh, system being developed right now. Uh, before I open the panel uh, for uh, questions from you all, I have one last question. If you had to send out uh, this a platform where there are a lot of vendors outside India, a lot of people who are working on healthcare and healthcare related technology, what is it that you want to convey to them as a message? Please concentrate on the Indian workflow and please concentrate on solutions that work that can be easily adopted and that are reasonably intuitive and definitely for the technology crowd make the license cost much lower than what it is to My advice would just simply be look, solve a real problem. Right? Don't look at what everyone else is doing and just trying to make a cheaper EMR or look at an SAP or maybe make a new you know, healthy eating app. Solve the real problem. Go to the hospitals. Come to me. I'll, you know, I'll be happy to spend a day with anyone over here and just explain where the real problems are. You'll be able to see for yourself by looking from a completely different perspective how uh, a new set of eyes can change the way we've been looking at conventional problems. Uh, I would say typically when uh, vendors come and they say, okay, I've got a software and this can do the following kind of things. Uh, I would actually say, okay, you pick up a business uh, situation or a business challenge which is actually bothering you to the healthcare industry. And come and say, okay, these are the various solutions, technology, I can give it to you uh, as a term to your order. But go based upon the business challenge and don't bring technology and exchange, you still do a great thing. That will definitely work because what management wants is don't say cloud or not cloud or C or machine or whatever. Take the business challenge, the business case, and then align the technology with that. Not the other way.
Nothing. Okay. So, uh, okay. Let's say if I if it do one, sorry, you could still do all your questions off by the panels for real. Don't do that. So basically, I was wondering that we were talking about real challenges and real questions, but I guess very few questions came about. Uh, I guess one of the buzzword couple of years back used to be telemedicine. Telemedicine, right? Because parents are protected upon the issue of lack of infrastructure in the remote part of the country and other areas. A few years back, telemedicine was touted as the next big thing, and uh, with the communication technologies improving as it has in the past couple of years, I would have thought that would have taken up more bandwidth. But I don't see most many hospitals doing too much on that. I would have assumed that as the next thing to take care of, because that allows you to scale with the relatively low real estate costs of under one hundred. You buy me a bit. Take that. I know. I, mean, I just don't want to call it any medicine an extreme thing because it's happening now. I agree the adoption is not widely uh, rampant there, but definitely all hospitals, all network hospitals, all hospitals that work with other hospitals use a lot of telemedicine for tertiary care giving, for monitoring primary health. So a lot of it is happening today, and. The use of effective low bandwidth audio video is happening today. So the ask is not for higher bandwidth. The ask is for optimized lower bandwidth with better quality, not higher. But telemedicine is something that's getting on into our DNA. So I don't want to call it the next big thing. But having said that, good job, keep it up, and keep continuing and increase the knowledge. I'm just trying to what I'm saying. Telemedicine is definitely an India you see. It will work wherever you have lack of uh, specialist uh, consultations. Let's take an example. Say, Salem, uh, there is a case and the doc local doctor needs a very specialist consultation, say, from, from X hospital in Bangalore. So, that will be the plan. Because what happens uh, today, we cannot do a primary consultation using telemedicine. It has to be a physical consultation. A doctor who is writing a prescription has to be has to be the consultation. So he can get to uh, initiate or activate the diagnosis to get the specialist consultation. Yeah, uh, uh, I guess you're right. Uh, I think I was also the same opinion that telemedicine uh, is a buzzword which has not worked. It is still in the, in the queue. Uh, but uh, today, when I was uh, giving my lunch, I was told by one of the gentlemen who were there, gentlemen who were there in the lunch meeting, that uh, they have done that, and 5,000 patients are coming in every day to a Delhi hospital to over telemedicine, um, over the telemedicine process. But, but I think uh, when technology and all those things are fine, there are two things which uh, need to be addressed. One is the payment mechanism for the doctors. Uh, on, on telemedicine and the second thing is uh, the the ability of the doctors to accept this as a way to do or the providers to do it as a way to do. The, the Israel is a country which has made telemedicine as a way to go for whatever reasons it is a small in size, maybe the traveling is a, a problematic thing but there the doctors have accepted it. But uh, uh, Norway and Sweden are the, on the other extreme where they don't accept it at all. The country like Germany, uh, the doctors go through telemedicine but don't, they don't get paid. The country like USA, they have absolutely ignored uh, telemedicine because they, they, in the US the doctors are paid per service and they don't get a salary. So when they are extending the service, no one knows how they are paid. And the, uh, doc, the rules are very different in the US. A doctor in New Jersey cannot treat a doctor in uh, maybe, uh, maybe Pennsylvania. So given that these are the restrictions, so telemedicine has not moved in those words for various reasons as I told you. But one country which has tracked a developing country is Rwanda, where again telemedicine has been a super success because they seem to have lack of doctors and they, they felt that the way to go is uh, through telemedicine. So saying that it has not worked possibly is right. But saying that it is growing is a, is a good good statement to make. These are the hindrances that should be other than technology. Well, Vaidyo Narayan Ohari is what they say. Your doctor is part. Now the, the, you don't have a part coming to you unless there is a need for him to do so. You go to the doctor. 
That's one of the reasons possible intelligence is going to take off well. That was on a very light way. You go to the next place. Maybe after this one more. Um, the question I had was, uh, you know, there were many issues that were thrown around and I, I guess the hospitals had a very different focus on how they want uh, technology to enable their business. Um, so there are two aspects, right? One is the consumerization of technology where you have to build, you have, you know, those kind of wellness applications which are preventive sort of uh, things which are very uh, uh, local, customized, app developer, you know, very, very, I would say, uh, marginalized technology uh, service provision. And on the other hand, you have, let's say, uh, complex diagnostics. Like you have, let's say, healthcare uh, treatment advisory, like if you saw the ones in hand, uh, so they can cross the same thing as all the distribution. So the issue is that how do you actually see this uh, both ends spanning on? Because, you know, one is you are trying to kind of create more preventive sort of solutions for wellness. Can I get the question? Very specific. So the very specific thing if you ask us questions, please. Because by the time we finish, I think we would have lost where you started from. Sorry. So there are two aspects. The first aspect is uh, B2C or wellness uh, user and stuff. Second is high end systems where you have to pay a lot. Obviously, there was a lot of propensity not to pay. Or let's say uh, believing that technology is not serving the purpose uh, because of flawed implementations or uh, bad requirements. So uh, the question was that how how do the three CIOs see both these aspects playing out? For instance, if the cloud is now a solution to be uh, lowering your license costs, be able to provide it on a paper use basis, you see that as a solution for higher technology. And on the other end, you see that there will be actually one provider who can provide the entire spectrum vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, uh, small app developers or you know, your in-house developments which will basically do the end. Yes, there are two sides of it. We have to understand that as much as we keep the, pain, the human being healthy, that is preventive. So we need to ensure that how we can use the right technology which is the combination of apps, which is the combination of wearable devices, which is the combination of it being hosted on the cloud, so that we can reach out to the patient even when he's not directly in the hospital. So that is continue going to exist. The other aspect of it is also going to exist where they deal with tertiary healthcare, very complex because there are complex body conditions that happen that need health interventions. So in those also, how can we use the right mix of technology so that the right experts, they may not always be under one roof, can come together. Is it a cloud, private cloud, is it an app? There are ways in which, these are ways in which we believe we can solve the problem. But the center of our universe I can definitely feel is the patient. And we need to look at the technology not, not as a cloud, not as an app, not as mobility, not as 4G, but look at it as what can we deliver so that we are able to reach out to the patient to solve the healthcare need and thereby ensure that the whole part is kept healthy. And I mean whole part kept healthy, I don't mean something very godly, I mean something also from an economic standpoint that it is not kept healthy. Just to clarify, that wasn't the question. The question was, can one service provider, let's say an Infosys or whatever, provide the entire spectrum? No. Okay. Uh, see, typically the approach uh, will be, you know, based on the payment you take, right? So one provider cannot do all the applications. You have to have a couple of providers based on the payment. And there is an SIMO which comes in between, right? It is all those technologies to work together. So I don't think there will be one supplier that can give everything. But there can be a integrator who can speak to different suppliers and make the whole piece deliverable. It's just a spread of expertise and putting it all under one person would make it hugely complicated and we may not be able to tap the expertise that independent is. So straight answer. Yeah, Pankaj, my name is Pankaj Sahar. 
have one question basically. See, so far in Bible we've been talking about adoption of standards. Now, whereas to a large extent, I feel maybe you can give your comments on that next question. That the problem is essentially about the creation of standards. Because as speaker number two mentioned at length, that you know it doesn't seem to be a infrastructure portability issue, but rather it seems to be a design issue fundamentally. Number one. Number two, we will be talking only uh, about mainly about processes, EMR and stuff like that. What about uh, diagnostic and imaging tools? For example, if one looks at the reviewers, uh, there seems to be a lot of problem because proprietary stand standards are deeply entrenched, interoperability, and the net uh, problem is faced by the, uh, by the patient, right? So you are going to pay for that and open standards, creation of standards and open standards. Let me hit the diagnostic first. Yes. I think it's a legacy problem that uh, diagnostic uh, technology is, is proprietary. But now we have the uh, open standards and most of the uh, diagnostic companies adopt the low open standards so that when you move from one vendor to another vendor on diagnostics, you are not stuck with a patented technology that you are not able to uh, move your images. So I think that problem is slowly vanishing. Obviously, we got to get rid of all the legacy and hence you got to get started. On the design of uh, standards, you got to look at the standards such that it caters to all aspects of the healthcare and it caters to other aspects of a particular of standards that are used across the uh, ration card where there are some standards. You got to use them such that they are common and hence when standards are designed, Interoperability has to be looked at. Interoperability is not only within healthcare institutions, but it is also outside of whoever will be consuming that healthcare information. It could also be a school that is getting healthcare information of all the vaccines of all the children studying in the school. So, standards are designed across with interoperability uh, uh, thing, uh, ideas. Uh, I missed the third question. Can, can, can we, can open we standards or we want to address that with them? Open standards again, as long as it complies within interoperability, as long as open standards are not radical that, allow, that make the processes change for standards and vice versa, which will not work, which is the reason why people don't adopt technology. I think open standards is not something anybody is averse to do. So, it, I, I definitely feel that today open standards is not an issue. I think we'll come up the next set of questions on the slide. Fans want to be allowed, we would uh, interact with them, please uh, clarify what your queries, questions, doubts, and many. Uh, to the end of the panel, uh, I should say, uh, we discussed about a lot of issues, issues which are today in the adaption and the doctors don't do this, the operational uh, uh, processes are not weak, or the system is not getting aligned with the operational processes, uh, the costs are dropped with him, customization has not been done properly because there was a lack of understanding by the providers who are deploying the solutions. There, there, there have been a lot of these kind of issues and these are issues which are going to be there. It's going to continue. It's not that it's going to stop overnight and then some, some one fine morning or something says, hey, I'm not completely ready, I'm going to sit there to now look at the technology and adapt it for our use. But then the message is very clear that today all the hospitals, all the service providers here in India are working towards from what we uh, said, solving the issues, making it easier for the patient to come in and approach and seek healthcare services. So it is about the ease at which he is able to expect or he is able to take over or take back healthcare services from all the providers. At the same time, the providers are definitely looking and working towards moving from illness to wellness. 
or moving from reactive to proactive care. And that is where I think this market is moving towards. And, and the message, what is there from this panel is that you can look at a lot of these large and smaller technology innovation and adaption in this space which is going to happen in the near future which each one of the service providers are going to adapt to make it easier for only one set of people, the patient. I think that's the message from the panel. Thank you ladies and gentlemen for uh, your, your patience and being with us. We did uh, go over more longer time. I'm uh, sorry for that, but then I thought it was a healthy discussion and then you enabled us to go beyond the time. Thank you so much. Thank you for the last time of the long day. The panelists certainly helped the attention of the speakers. Well, that is the, the only benefit uh, you get when you come in right? You don't have to worry about when you stop. I request uh, the chair to kindly present token of gratitude to uh, Guru, Guru. Excuse me. Raja. Raja. Uh, Raja. Come this way. Okay. And uh, to Mr. Vinayan Shetty. Uh, Mr. Vinayan Shetty, Mr. Vinayan Shetty, Mr. Vinayan Shetty, Mr. Vinayan Shetty, Good evening. I think in addition to thanking you for participating at CIVIT, I've got to give you a big thanks and perhaps also all of us here, especially you, all deserve a, a bravery award for, <laughs> for braving all the incumbent weather but making it out here and staying true to your commitment to helping us launch a technology event that will go on to make a difference. In my talk yesterday, I was talking about a strong foundation to build big ambitions. And tonight is about one recognizing that one of those strong foundation pieces, but it's also about thanking this person and the region he represents for staying committed and true to the Indian global and local cause. I welcome you all on behalf of CBIT to the Victorian Government Network of Evening. We've got the right type of networking organized for you, which is a short speech, and then we go to the lagoon where thirsty throats and Hungry tummies will be fed, well fed. To kick off proceedings, I'd like to introduce, well, I promised I'd be very, very kosher. <laughs> um, a technologist, an entrepreneur, and an India fan. Commissioner Wayne, do you mind if I call you Wayne? Commissioner Wayne, he's had a long and distinguished service to technology and to Australia and also to India. He started his career in the Australian Defence Forces and went on to become the head of the Department of Aerospace Technology in 1991. From there on, he managed a number of international training projects in China, Hong Kong and Bhutan. He joined the Victorian government in 1995 and he was the linchpin for the investment attraction development program for the government. In 2001, he went on to do a further specialization in ICT, business development in that aspect. During that time, Wayne worked very closely with 
India's Bell Learners, so TCS, Infosys, and Briasoft, facilitating the development of Victoria and Melbourne as the preferred location for Indian ICT companies. What is not written in the submission of the profile that I've got is that he has also been a crucial supporter of CBIT in Australia right from the very beginning. He was instrumental in the development and negotiation of the government MOU between the Victorian government and the Indian state of Karnataka. And under this, he managed a range of investment trade projects in India. He was not surprised that because of this India Connect, he was appointed in 2005 as the government's commissioner to India. Following his appointment, that happened in 2005, November. Following that appointment, he got busy, like he always is. And over the next two years, he established the government's trade and investment office in India. He created an office in Bangalore from scratch and recruited a, an excellent team of investment and trade professionals who are here in this room today. As commissioner, he was not only responsible for the Victorian government's trade and investment activities throughout India, but also for the whole government relationship dealing with Indian government and many of India's leading state governments. In 2008, he was appointed Deputy Secretary, Industry and Trade and Chief Executive Officer of the Victoria government's international investment agency in West Victoria. So, I think that about sets the tone for the sort of evening we're going to have. In order to kick off this networking evening, I'd like to invite him on stage to give us his view on the future. Thanks, Mahal. Um, my speech is actually going to be shorter than his introduction. Um, I'm conscious of two things, and I'm not sure any of us deserve a bravery award. Only us people that came out tonight deserve the bravery award. I think it's actually uh, the greater reward is to have this common sense to stay here for another couple of hours until the rain stops. But um, look, um, welcome everybody, and. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, and all of that stuff. I, 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 I'm not, uh, Australians are not great at acknowledging people because everybody in the room is important because they're our friends. So I'd like to welcome you here. Yes, I do have a long history with CBIT, and um, it's fair to say I think I've been to CBIT Hanover either six or seven times. Um, and I've been involved with uh, Jackie Taranto in Australia and the whole uh, CBIT team. So. When we found out that uh, CBIT were coming in an official way to India, we were first to line up and say we want to support it. And uh, we think it's a great move here in Karnataka um, to uh, actually grow the presence. And CBIT does these sorts of things better than anybody else in the world. And I'll, I'll collect my feet later for that. But um, getting uh, along to why I'm here tonight, Victoria has a very significant presence in uh, India. It's interesting uh, for most people to understand that Australian states actually have their own state representative offices around the world. We've got something like 20 or 21, I've lost count, I think we're just about to open one in Turkey. Uh, we have our own offices around the world and I can probably say this safely because there's none of our federal government or centre government reps here tonight. We do that because we think we look after ourselves better than anybody else does. And uh, we're also very, very keen uh, to support and grow our industry. Um, we've had the office here since 2005, and uh, more recently, in the last 18 months, we opened an office in Mumbai. Uh, I was asked a few minutes ago by no less a person than the IT Minister for Karnataka why we were in Bangalore, and it was, simple, it was a very simple decision back in 2005. This was the centre of the uh, IT industry in India. And uh, fair to say that despite a lot of other places trying and despite the roads and the traffic and everything else, it still is. And it's really important uh, for us as a government that is focused on IT, biotech and the technology industries. 
uh, that we have our main office here in Bangalore. And despite our best efforts in chasing investment across the whole range of sectors, the fact is that still something like 85 or 90 per cent of our investment is out of the IT sector into our industry. Um, I'm in between you and dinner, so I'll try and keep this brief. But I should tell you a few things about our home state. Um, the capital is Melbourne, and most of you will have heard of that. Um, it's a small city uh, by Indian standards, 4.5 million people, um, and it's the home of the MCG. That about sums it up. Uh, and it's the sports capital of the world, as we like to say. Uh, MotoGP, Formula One GP, Melbourne Cup, Boxing Day Test, do I need to say any more? Well, Australian Tennis Open. So uh, we like to say it's a pretty good place to be. While we're only about 3% of Australia's geography, uh, we currently earn around about 25 to 26% of the country's GDP. And we do that off the back of our people and our smarts. We don't have mining, we do have brown coal, but nobody wants to buy that. But essentially, we're a state that's very small in geography, and basically we sell ourselves to the world in innovation and technology and uh, ICT is an important part of that. Um, our IT sector turns over around about $30 billion of a gross state product of $330 billion, which for those here who are into economics is about slightly bigger than the economy of Singapore. So again, our state population is around about 5.7 million, so that will give you a fair idea. We've got an industry, IT industry, of about 7,000 companies. Most of them are tiny. You wouldn't even call them micro companies here in India. Many of the companies we deal with are only got half a dozen people. Um, but what they have got is they've got a diverse and flexible range of staff working for them, they're innovators, and they're not frightened to go out and take on the world. Um, for example, and I will look at my notes for this, in a Coles to Newcastle category, when you book a flight with that very large airline that's not Indian Airlines here, you'll be using Melbourne-based technology. When a dairy farmer in Gujarat gets paid for his milk, he gets paid on Melbourne-based technology. And very shortly, uh, when you uh, want to walk through, say, Delhi Airport or one of our major airports here, your passenger movement's going to be managed by Melbourne-based technology. And if you go to some of the more innovative uh, historic sites in India, your experience will be enhanced by Melbourne-based technology. All of these companies that do this, I think without exception, have got less than 50 or 60 people. Um, and that's one of the things that we like to market. We're a small state, we're a small government, and we have small companies, but they're quite innovative. This, of course, is not a, uh, uh, we don't want it to be a one-way street, and it's a two-way street. Um, my colleague was saying a few moments ago that uh, we have many of the IT majors. Um, within 18 months of starting a focus on India, I think we had eight out of the top 10 Indian NASCOM listed companies having their Australian base in Melbourne. We actually set out to make Melbourne the preferred location for Indian companies and we work really hard at welcoming to Melbourne. But not just the majors, uh, we're happy to, to uh, help along the little companies like smaller ones, Dexler and many others um, that uh, perhaps Australia might be their first global reach and we think the Australian market is a great place for them to, uh, to enter into what is one of the most vibrant IT markets in Australia. We're also lucky here this week to have a number of small Australian companies here, InfoActive, working in India for over five years in uh, supply chain, product recovery, sustainability solutions. Innomail, providing robust billing services for telcos. DNAX, offering generic testing for athletes and sports persons. I could probably do with some of that myself. And Hospital and Patient Services Limited, uh, who are experts in secure comms and communications for hospitals and patients over various geographies. These are typical of Melbourne-based Victorian-based, small companies, real innovators, people that are out in the market and they're not frightened to come to India. Um, and that, uh, for us, is a great thing. I should say in the last three years, we've brought some 650 Victorian companies to India and over 100 of those companies have been technology-based companies or IT companies. 
I should also like to say tonight that we're very uh, pleased to have some guests from Kerala here tonight, GTEC and Kerala. Uh, fantastic group of people. Um, it's, India is an interesting place, uh, you know, uh, often the uh, foreign governments, we're all focused on Gujarat now for all sorts of reasons, we're focused on the new government and everything else, but you have these little uh, states that some people think are just tourist states or whatever, and there they are, I think we had a trade mission down to Victoria last year, we took 17 or 20 companies down and 17 that are doing business in Australia after one trade mission. So that's an example of Indian business entrepreneurship and ingenuity. So, look, I would like to finish now because what I'd love to do is talk to as many people as I can in my team, and I just ask my team to stand up. Please. Gopi, Gopi Shankar, Sergius, Joseph, Nick. Uh, IT, IT whiz up the back. He knows more about IT than, I, you know, I barely, without him, can't even turn a computer on, so. Uh, and, uh, and we've got others down here who are too embarrassed to stand up, so they know who they are. But look, I would like to formally welcome you here tonight, have a really nice time, um, and go and drink some drink, and I'll have a glass of red wine if they've got one, and come and have a talk to me, and if we can help you, we will. Thank you so much. After you host, you tell us where to go. Sure, right. So now I'd like to invite the next three speeches. That could be another five. <laughs> no. Um, thank you very much. Um, it's evident that Victoria is in the DNA of a lot of technology projects here in India. And now you're in the DNA of CBIT in India. And for that, we thank you for giving us that opportunity. Without further ado, I'd like us all to move to the lagoon area, to the beautiful incumbent weather. It's nicely covered and there are some hot and cold drinks as well. Thank you. Thank you.